Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello, welcome to lecture two in week five. Today we are going to discuss um, semiconductors with embedded uh, nanoparticles. This is an example where uh, we want to describe how the recent advances in the last 10, 15 years uh, um, have allowed us to change thermoelectric properties and make better materials. The example is from our own research, but I try to uh, describe the broader impact. So the idea is um, to combine semi-metallic nanoparticles of erbium arsenide in a semiconductor with 3-5 semiconductors such as indium gallium or indium gallium aluminum arsenide. The structure of the semiconductor is zinc blend, um, where you can see the atoms for arsenic uh, group three elements, indium, gallium, or aluminum, as well um, as erbium. Erbium arsenide is a, a rock salt structure uh, with similar lattice constant. And erbium arsenide here is a density of state, some calculation is a semi-metal at the position of the Fermi energy, density of states is not zero. Um, why we looked at this is this is one way to combine something metallic with something semiconducting in an epitaxial way and the idea we wanted to do is to look at metal semiconductor composites. The way uh, this form, uh, these films are formed is uh, through molecular beam epitaxy. Basically is layer by layer growth of um, molecular beams of indium gallium arsenide arriving and under the appropriate pressure and temperature of the substrate, uh, they make layer by layer growth and you get a very nice crystalline material. You can see um, the crystal lines by eye quite well. Um, so it's very nice. But if in addition uh, to this 3-5 uh, uh, material, we also have some uh, flux of uh, erbium incident, um, when the solubility limit is exceeded, uh, nanoparticles are formed and these black regions that is shown in the high resolution TEM as well as in the lower magnification right is you have um, these uh, nanoparticles um, and here is a size distribution measured using TEM. Average size 2 to 3 nanometer. Why is 2 to 3 nanometer has to do with the surface energy arguments and the growth conditions? But this is a way where nanostructures are grown um, and kind of automatically as you grow the material. Since the growth rate could be one or two microns per hour, it's possible over a day or so, uh, make layers as thick as 60 microns so, so that you can do thermoelectric measurement over large areas. Um, these are higher resolution, um, um, high, uh, uh, high angular, uh, annular angle diffraction, um, uh, uh, patterns um, and scanning tunneling electron microscopy um, images through the Z contrast you can identify where are the arsenic atom, where are the indium atom, where is the erbium and again here is the blue lines basically tell you that the arsenic sublattice is continuous. You have a nanoparticle completely embedded instead of uh, replacing group 3 here you have um, erbium. Uh, this is one of the unique cases that you can um, add a material with significantly different uh, mass and uh, bond strength, uh, basically um, acoustic uh, impedance uh, difference inside and affect uh, heat transport, but we will also discuss that it will also change thermal transport. The effect on thermal conductivity uh, is dramatic. It was first shown uh, by Vujul Kim et al. in 2006. In the case of indium gallium arsenide, it behaves like most alloys. Um, temperate thermal conductivity rises um, at low temperatures, peaks around 200 to about six, uh, six and a half watt per meter Kelvin. At room temperature, is something on the order of five, and then goes down because of phonon phonon interactions by just adding 0.3 percent of these nanoparticles. Thermal conductivity is significantly reduced from five to three at uh, room temperature. You add more and more nanoparticles is even reduced more. 
uh, first question is why is the thermal conductivity reduced uh, as much these solid and dashed lines are a simulation done by Vuchu Kim and all um, the method is actually what uh, you learn in week two in Professor Lundstrom's uh, lectures uh, thermal conductivity is shown as an integral of a heat capacity phonon group velocity and mean free path again it's very interesting if you take this formalism which is the conventional um, way of calculating thermal conductivity and represent it as a type of a Landauer formalism because then you can see the analogy between electrons and um, phonons. Uh, so what is different is uh, the phonon mean free path now is uh, has three components boundary scattering, impurity scattering, and umclap scattering, phonon phonon scattering and this is the new term when you have nanoparticles two to three nanometer you need to calculate this more accurately. Um, Vuchul Kim and Arun Majumdar uh, basically develop a new scattering theory. Uh, 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 this shows the scattering efficiency versus the size parameter. The size parameter is uh, the incident wave vector times the size of the scatter. So it's an indication of how big are uh, the scatter with respect to the incident wave. Um, at uh, small uh, size parameters, at small scales, basically we have a Rayleigh limit um, scattering scales with wavelength to the power fourth, one over wavelength over four, and the size of the nanoparticle to the six, very strong dependence. But when the size of the scatterers are large, you get to the geometrical scattering limit. Uh, you can describe it as a function of uh, average cross-sectional area of the scatterers. Because nanoparticles are not all uniformly sized, you can take some sort of um, average of scatterers for, as a function uh, with some size distribution function. Using the simple uh, type of uh, analysis uh, and considering the scattering strength, which is really coming from the acoustic impedance mismatch, you can fit those results. You can even explain that more intuitively um, uh, by just a uh, picture. If I have a bulk alloy, uh, in an alloy there are atomic substitutions, so you can scatter high frequency short wavelength phonons effectively, but the long wavelength phonons go from the hot to the cold side. Now in the same uh, crystal, if now you add nanoparticles, the size of these match to the size of mid long wavelength phonons and you can scatter these phonons as well as scattering the long wa short wavelength phonons. And these two together is what reduce the thermal conductivity. The analogy that Arun Majumdar gives is, is like having clouds in the sky. That's why the, the sun doesn't uh, 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 have as much radiation when it reaches earth when you have clouds because the size of the water molecules uh, is a similar size of the light wavelength so you can scatter light efficiently that's what is happening for phonons inside the semiconductor but these nanoparticles have also an electrical impact um, here is the band alignment between erbium arsenide and indium gallium arsenide metrics or if you have a gallium arsenide or indium aluminum arsenide metrics what happened is that uh, erbium arsenide is a semi-metal, but the band uh, Fermi energy is near the conduction band of ingas. That means easily it can give rise to electrons, free electrons in the uh, matrix and make the matrix conducting. That's, that means these scatterers for phonons are also electrically active and to the first order um, they actually provide charge. A question is, a charge that is coming from these nanoparticles, how would it affect electron mobility compared if the charge was coming from a standard dopant? Um, that's something uh, that can be uh, calculated. I will show you a little bit, but the end result is if you took the room temperature data, thermal conductivity of material with erbium arsenide compared to the that without erbium arsenide is reduced by almost a factor of two. The power factor is actually increased by uh, something on the order of 10%. As a result, ZT is doubled. Of course, the ZT is small at room temperature, so this doubling doesn't give you a large ZT. Um, but the principle shows that you can 
both reduce the thermal conductivity and um, increase the power factor. What is the temperature dependence and how this is scattering affected uh, is quite dramatic. Uh, here is the experimental electrical conductivity of indium gallium aluminum arsenide versus temperature um, uh, when it's silicon dope standard bulk material or to the case where uh, compared to the case where you have 0.6 percent of these nanoparticles again um, when you change concentration of nanoparticle the average size don't change and is similar to 0.6 uh, uh, to the same 2 to 3 nanometer here is the measured Seebeck coefficient and here are the, some of the theory that I'm going to explain a little bit. So first of all, the trends are very different. Uh, in a, any a standard bulk semiconductor, you expect by increasing temperature, because you increase um, phonon, um, electron phonon interactions, uh, mobility goes down, electrical conductivity goes down. So that as is expected. And usually, Seebeck coefficient goes up when electrical conductivity goes down. That's also because the Fermi window factor gets bigger and we are in a regime where still uh, the asymmetry in the density of states matter, so we can see this increase. But what is um, quite surprising is the 0.6% erbium arsenide has a very different dependence. Electric conductivity goes up and almost saturates. At the same time, the Seebeck coefficient also goes up. The question is, how can we explain both trends using these electrical properties of embedded nanoparticles? Um, here, a scattering theory is very important. Um, when you have a, t a point a scatterer, uh, uh, an electron wave is coming, we can use Born approximation. Born approximation is a perturbation theory, point size potential, and assume low barriers. Uh, Mona Zabarjadi et al. Uh, in 2009 looked at the case when electron wave is scattering from a finite size nanoparticle. Here is the exact solution of the Schrodinger equation, finite size scattering center. Um, it's harder to implement, but using partial wave technique, the kind of asymptotic solutions of the Schrodinger equation near the nanoparticle, you can actually calculate the scattering cross-section accurately. This is uh, something which was also done, I guess, uh, around the same time for nanoparticles in lead um, uh, telluride uh, uh, by authors uh, at Lawrence uh, Livermore. Um, in both cases here, we consider these as independent scatterers. Um, in the regimes we are, we don't need to consider multiple scatterings, but if one needs to consider that, then coherent potential approximation is the right way, and this paper in Nanoletters described that. Basically, in this paper, um, it was shown that this type of uh, coherent uh, uh, interactions, particle uh, interferences uh, between the scatterings from neighboring particles when the concentration is high could be useful if the size is uniform at low temperatures. Here are um, the experimental versus theoretical mobility of one of these samples. So here's electromobility, the 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000 of very large numbers. This is a low effective mass material. This is versus temperature. For a bulk indium gallium arsenide, the dominant scattering at low temperatures ionize impurity and at high temperatures um, is polar optical uh, phonon uh, scattering. Alloy scattering and acoustic phonons are there, but there are much less. When, what you see here is that by adding nanoparticles, at the high, at low temperature range, um, you don't affect electron mobility, but at high temperature range, that's what determines the electron mobility and how it drops with temperature. So, adding of the nanoparticles cannot be neglected from an electrical point of view, even though they are perfectly epitaxially uh, embedded. Here is another graph, um, uh, very important, uh, hopefully it should be published soon, shows electron mobility versus carrier density in the material if electrons come from standard dopants, in this case silicon doped in gas, um, these are the red triangles, as well as when the electrons come from erbium arsenide nanoparticles. Uh, here is you have 0.08% erbium arsenide, here is 0.6% erbium arsenide, one of the good concentration, and here you go to a couple of percent. 
Um, the different uh, theory curve corresponds to different compensation factor. This is basically a fitting parameter that one uses when you put certain amount of dopant in the material, not everything is activated. Um, so especially at high carrier densities, you need to consider some sort of compensation that's like some extra scattering mechanism. What is important is up to the dopings of about 2 or 3, um, 10 to the 18 uh, per centimeter cube. The doping at which the maximum power factor of this low um, um, uh, effective mass material happens, these are all for indium gallium arsenide. Um, basically, you don't see a difference between erbium arsenide and the silicon dope. That's quite important. That means you're able to reduce thermal conductivity here by up to a factor of almost two or uh, 60, 70 percent without affecting electromobility. And that's only possible if you don't introduce uh, a, a, a defects in the crystal. Once you have fitted with these parameters, electromobility and electroconductivity, the Seebeck coefficient can be calculated directly without any additional fitting parameters. Here is the Seebeck coefficient versus temperature of the control sample, 2 10 to the 18 per centimeter cube, silicon doped, indium gallium arsenide, indium gallium aluminum arsenide in this case, sorry, I'm comparing the aluminum case that was in that reference. Um, and the one with 0.6% erbium arsenide, again, a very good match between theory and experiment. At the end, what we have, um, uh, the first result uh, were presented in the Journal of Applied Physics in 2010. The best control samples have ZTs of about 0.8. That's actually people have found for some of the 3.5 even in 1960s. By this, a lot of engineering, putting the nanoparticle ZT of 1.33 has been demonstrated with this indium gallium aluminum arsenide. And with indium gallium arsenide and fine tuning of the dopings and erbium arsenide, the numbers are higher, uh, 1.5, 1.6, and so on. What is important is most of the improvement at high temperature comes from the thermal conductivity reduction, but still there is 5% power factor enhancement. Uh, still, we are doing a little work toward that. An important question is, um, now that we have a theory that explains how uh, this behave, we should do some predictive, uh, um, uh, some predictions about how far this could go. In a more recent paper that came out in Applied Physics Letter in 2011, um, Bach, uh, Bianza, all looked at what would be the power factor. We are interested now, uh, just on the electrical side, how this nanoparticle scattering, how much could help? What is kind of the ultimate limit? There is always an optimum carrier density for the bulk material shown here in pink. The optimum carrier density is about 2 or 3, 10 to the 18, and this maximum power factor is about 40 some uh, in these units of microwatt per centimeter per Kelvin square. In similar units, the power factor of bismutelloride and so on is actually similar. So these are good power factor numbers. Um, here are the parameters changing the nanoparticle diameter uh, radius from one nanometer to two nanometer, and then changing how many electrons come from these nanoparticles. And uh, you can see the best case and which when the, is when the nanoparticle has a radius of 1.5 and they give one electron. Why the fact that nanoparticles give one or two electrons should have this much impact on improving the power factor has to do with this picture. Here is a potential profile near an ionized impurity. This is the usual approximation. Uh, but when you have a nanoparticle of a finite size of 1 or 1.5, what you have is a, a nanoparticle that is metallic, so you don't have any band bending, gives electron. There is a band uh, bending near the nanoparticle. These tails of potential near the nanoparticle scatter electrons. And in a very simple um, Fermi golden rule picture, Fourier transform, a special Fourier transform of this potential profile give you the energy dependence of a scattering time. And this slowly varying one can give you a large energy dependence, um, high frequency scattering terms uh, that changes the frequency dependence of the uh, scattering time as a result improve the power factor. That's these tails play a role. 
at the end, uh, the most we can do is, uh, you know, maybe 40% here, ideal case. You also saw that by adding nanoparticles more and more, you can keep reducing thermal conductivity, but electrons are very kind of sensitive particles. You cannot add more, in this case, with low effective mass material, more than 0.6% or half a percent of these nanoparticles before you really reduce the um, electron um, uh, mobility significantly. How can you overcome this? Um, uh, so you uh, combine different ideas. Here is a paper actually from a couple of years ago, 2006. We know with some sort of endium gallium arsenide, with erbium arsenide, we have some reduced thermal conductivity. How about if you combine this effect with electron filtering that happens in the super lattice. So you basically make layers of 20 nanometer indium gallium arsenide with erbium arsenide with a 10 nanometer indium gallium aluminum arsenide. This has a band discontinuity, uh, aluminum concentration that give a band discontinuity on the order of uh, 100, 200 MeV. As a result, electrons moving across to the plane are filtered while the one in the plane are not filtered. This is the conventional idea of energy filtering. And here are the measured Seebeck coefficient versus doping for four different samples. We measured in plane, out of plane. For out of plane, we use the sophisticated device geometry to create integrated heaters. And you can see the Seebeck coefficient is an isotropic as expected because in this direction, by through filtering, you increase the Seebeck coefficient. In this direction, you don't. Uh, the factor of three is significant and that matches the theory. Again, the, th the results are scattered. From this, we cannot say if his lateral momentum conserved uh, or not but at least you see the effect. And in this paper, there are predictions, even uh, with the conserved lateral momentum at high temperatures, still you can get good um, performance. These samples were uh, thick enough to do cross-plane Seebeck measurements, couple of micron, but not thick enough to do cross-plane electroconductivity measurement. For that, depending on the conductivity of the material, we need something on the order of 10 or 20 micron, um, and we didn't have that with these samples. This idea of how nanoparticles could affect transport have been, uh, can be used in other materials. Natalia Mingo, uh, in a paper, described what he called nanoparticle and alloy for thermal conductivity reduction. Basically, if you put a nanoparticle of a given size, in this case silicide, inside the silicon germanium matrix or inside silicon matrix, there is an interesting effect that happens. Here is the calculated thermal conductivity for a fixed percentage of nanoparticles as a function of nanoparticle radius. When you have a silicon, there is no alloy scattering. Um, the, the smallest nanoparticle is the one that lowest, uh, give you the lowest thermal conductivity but it cannot go below 10, which is still too high for good thermoelectric application. On the other hand, for an alloy like silicon and germanium, adding some nickel silicide or germanium as a scattering center, the optimum size is now 3 to 10 nanometer. And this, what is a uh, uh, scatter mid-long wavelength phonon and has a big impact. And you can see it can go below the alloy limit um, by factor of uh, 2 or 3. Uh, so this is example of how the engineering of the material property could be done. Embedded nanoparticles are the new concept and have been implemented in quite a few examples. Um, what you learn today is um, the embedded erbium arsenide nanoparticles in in-gas um, uh, can be done in a way that doesn't um, include any additional scattering. Uh, by the way, just as a matter of nomenclature, uh, if you look at Kanadziti's papers, these are called endoepitaxial nanoparticles. They have a bulk synthesis technique, but they still uh, pay attention of the lattice distortion around nanoparticle. When there is little distortion, they call it endoepitaxial. This is what we have here as well. Thermal conductivity reduction below alloy limit is possible because we have uh, mid-long wavelength form scattering that something cannot happen with uh, uh, dope, uh, uh, atomic um, substitutions and alloying. And finally, power factor enhancement is hard. You can get slightly improved mobility because you can call it a modulation doping, but effectively at the same carrier concentration, numbers are similar. At least you don't get uh, penalized. There 
could you call energy filtering? Um, actually, this is an area that um, kind of um, our perspective have changed. Early on, we thought nanoparticles are like having um, hills on a landscape of energy. And if electrons are have energy above the energy of the nanoparticle hills, they will be not scattered. And if they have below, they can be scattered. So we thought you can have an energy filtering in such a case. The detailed um, uh, calculations based on partial wave and so on uh, show that you don't have this cutoff energy. It's very hard to get with this random distribution of nanoparticles. In reality, you have an enhanced um, sharper energy dependence of the scattering time that comes from the potential profile of the nanoparticles, but not the barrier, uh, uh, not only what is the barrier that matters, but also the tails of the potential profile near the nanoparticles that scatter electrons, and that's um, an important factor. So what we will do in the uh, remaining lectures of week five, we look at some of the more other advanced concepts uh, for uh, thermoelectrics, um, uh, some of the understanding that happens uh, uh, with engineering different material uh, properties. Look forward uh, to seeing you in lecture three.